Who should control Afghanistan's foreign cash reserves? The U.S. moves to redistribute $7 billion held in New York and keep it out of the Taliban's hands. Some of it will go towards humanitarian aid. But is this plan fair to the Afghan people? This is Inside Story. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Mohammed Jamjoum. The Taliban's takeover of Afghanistan last August created a financial dilemma for nations holding the country's foreign cash reserves. The deposed Afghan government had $10 billion in central banks around the world. $7 billion were in the U.S. and the rest in Germany, Switzerland, the U.K. and the UAE. Those countries have refused to release the money to Taliban leaders in Kabul. As the dispute dragged on, Afghanistan's economy deteriorated. Foreign aid and banking services also were cut off. The UN believes 97 percent of Afghans will fall below the poverty line this year. More than half of the country's 40 million people face acute hunger. Now, the U.S. president has signed an order to redistribute the funds and keep them out of the Taliban's hands. Under the executive order, Joe Biden used emergency powers to split the $7 billion held in the U.S. Federal Reserve Bank in New York. He'll ask a judge for permission to put half of that into a trust fund for humanitarian relief in Afghanistan. The other half will be used to compensate the families of 9-11 victims. Some economists say the plan will do more harm than good. They argue it strips Afghanistan of resources that could be used to stabilize its economy. All right, joining me now are our guests. In Falls Church, Virginia, is David Sedney, Senior Associate for the Center for Strategic and International Studies. David is a former U.S. Deputy Assistant Secretary of Defense for Afghanistan. In Kabul is Pauline Balaman, Afghanistan Country Director for the Norwegian Refugee Council. And in Milan is Harun Rahimi, Assistant Professor of Law at the American University of Afghanistan. A warm welcome to you all, and thanks so much for joining us on the program today. Harun, let me start with you. I saw your Twitter feed after this news was announced about the executive order. And um, one of the things you wrote, you said, this is completely unacceptable. And you said that the people of Afghanistan are the true owner of these assets. So from your perspective, is this executive order from U.S. President Joe Biden legal? I do not believe it's legal. Um, the order invokes certain provisions of the U.S. law that authorizes the U.S. president to take actions against the foreign reserve of a country held inside the United States. Um, so I believe the lawyers advising the president have um, considered this to be consistent with their laws. Um, there's also uh, several extra actions that are needed to take place for this order to actually be fully executed. Um, there is uh, possibly in the future uh, someone from Afghanistan government uh, who has to authorize a transfer of some of these funds uh, to the trust fund so it can be used for aid, as uh, said it would be used. And uh, the other legal leg of this would be what the U.S. court would decide in terms of whether the Taliban had sufficient interest in these funds um, so the judgment that was entered into in absentia could be satisfied from these funds. But those are the questions of U.S. law, and uh, I'm not going to opine on those. But I think fundamentally, from the perspective of international law, these are reserves belonging to a foreign sovereign nation, uh, which is Afghanistan. And um, the question is not whether the Taliban uh, uh, own these assets or not, uh, from my perspective. It's a matter of whether Afghanistan as a country, as a state, um, as a, a sovereign nation, um, has a right to its uh, federal reserve, uh, to its uh, foreign reserve. And the answer has to be yes. And just the fact that reserves are within the U.S. territory, it does not authorize the president of the United States to make decisions that have such a ramification for the Afghan economy that is going to doom the Afghan currency uh, to becoming almost useless um, because these funds were the backing of the Afghan currency and all um, in effect issue a death sentence for the financial sector of the entire country. The result of which would be that the country would have no way but to be reliant on foreign aid almost indefinitely. 
David, from your vantage point, how unusual is this executive order from U.S. President Biden? And do you think that going forward it could be challenged? Well, it can certainly be challenged in court uh, if uh, there is someone who has standing to do so. Um, however, this kind of action by the United States government, uh, as uh, Professor Harun Rahimi uh, pointed out, uh, taken under U.S. law, uh, is actually uh, follows in many precedents uh, uh, going back um, uh, many, many decades. Uh, the reserves of countries such as Cuba, China, when the communists took over those countries, and a number of other countries um, uh, have been subject of similar actions. Or not, they're not exactly the same. Uh, what's different here is the decision to take uh, $3.5 million of it and to put it into some kind of a trust fund for humanitarian aid. Uh, there had been a l large outpouring of uh, people who wanted all the assets released to the Taliban, which is something that both politically and legally the United States government couldn't do, given the current court cases uh, and, the, and the politics here in the U.S. So the decision to take that three and a half million and uh, come up with some kind of trust fund, which the United States is now working with the U.N. other organizations to do so, that is something that is uh, different than has happened in the past. And uh, the legality of that and the practicality of that is something that needs to be worked out. Pauline, um, the NRC, Norwegian Refugee Council, and many other aid agencies have called um, these last several months for frozen assets to be released to Afghanistan. Um, what do you think about this executive order? I mean, do you think that this will actually help get humanitarian aid into Afghanistan? It's perhaps one avenue, um, but in all honesty, um, what we're seeing at the moment are very piecemeal, very kind of sticking plaster solutions to what is a fundamental economic crisis. The people in Afghanistan are feeling um, as if they're being economically strangled uh, by the lack of funds coming into the country, by the lack of um, not just aid, but um, economic um, viability within the country. So from contractors to construction to um, the general sort of turnover of what you would expect to give people livelihoods, that's not happening. So you have over 50% of the population who are dependent on humanitarian aid. Uh, and at the same time, that aid is, we're struggling to get it into the country. Um, so like I say, it's, it's a piecemeal attempt. It's not going to solve the problems. Um, first, we need money to be able to come into the country. We need um, access to financial services. We need a functioning central bank. Um, but at the same time, we need an investment in livelihoods and the economy and the country to be able to get back on its feet. Because in the meantime, um, people are, they have negative coping mechanisms. Um, nearly 9 million people are on the brink of starvation. People are not able to access basic health care. Um, they're, they're having to reduce the number of meals a day that they eat in order to be able to survive and to feed their families. And they cannot afford health care. So people are dying simply because they cannot get the services that they need for themselves and their families. Harun, I saw you nodding along to uh, some of what Pauline was saying there. Did you want to jump in? So I would like to um, basically make the point that following, um, Afghanistan was a poor country um, even before the U.S. withdrawal happened. Um, towards the end, most of Afghans were living below poverty. And uh, once the U.S. withdrew from the country, it was almost inevitable that um, if Taliban were take, to take over militarily, which was what happened, the aid would there would be a drop in aid and sanctions would have some, sequence, some consequences for the country, and the country would need um, aid and assistance to adjust to the new reality. Everyone knew that the adjustment would be painful, but there was there was a, there was at least hope uh, among some that sanctions would be revised, be more tailored, and central bank would be allowed to function as an independent entity subject to some limitations. And in some sort of way, Afghanistan would find its way towards a functioning economy again. A poor country, but at least a functioning economy. So that 40 million people who, are, who live there could earn a living, could actually earn a living. The current order, what it did in effect, 
made that a near impossibility. But basic, by, by basically removing the backing of the Afghan national currency, uh, making it very close to the use, uh, close to useless, as long as there is no foreign aid coming into the country, which would be the main source of uh, dollars for, for, for the country for, for foreseeable future. At the same time, sanctions are put in place, and their only exemptions are aid. So people who want to just give Afghans money so they can feed themselves, they can do so. But there are many other avenues for trade and, and uh, basic functions of the economy that are still strangled by, by, by sanctions. So if as long as those pieces are in place, and now in this scenario where the central bank really does not have a way to maintain a stability in the market, maintain the value of a pony, and facilitate foreign like USD denominator currency in the country, the prospect of Afghanistan finding its way towards an economy in middle term comes seems seems very bleak, which means the whole population is likely to stay in a current situation for a very long time. You also have to realize, and I think um, uh, our colleague, um, uh, our friend referred to this, um, the aid is not really reaching Afghanistan to the level it needs to. Um, UN Secretary Council, uh, sorry, UN uh, Secretary General just said that 9% of what is needed to help Afghans uh, from, uh, has been actually uh, delivered so far uh, mm -hmm. to the UN, what UN says it needs to. And this is not going to be, I mean, this is the first year where Afghans on top of the news. What's mm -hmm. going to happen the next year? Without doing what it needs to have an, Afghan, have an economy in Afghanistan, people are going to continue to suffer indefinitely. And Pauline, it also looked to me right now like you might have wanted to jump in and add to what Harun was saying. Go ahead. Um, just to say that in addition to the economic crisis, there are natural disasters in Afghanistan that exacerbate the situation. So, for example, NRC at the moment is responding um, to the people who've been affected by the earthquake in Baghdad and, and trying to help them to um, rebuild their homes, to have essential non-food items, just to be able to get through to the next day. So in addition to the economic situation, there is drought, there are earthquakes. There is um, a humanitarian crisis that underpins the rest of the, the economic dysfunction of the country. So um, I totally agree that what is needed in the medium to long term are some solutions to the livelihoods and the, um, that the country can get back to something that is normal in terms of functioning for people to be able to earn a living and, and support their families. But in the meantime, when you have nearly 50% of the population in need of humanitarian assistance with crisis after crisis, then there has to be, more has to be done to enable money to come into the country, to enable the economy to function and, and to have for aid organizations, whilst there has been a 4.4 billion appeal um, by the humanitarian community, the money is still only trickling in. And, and if, if that is what is needed just to get people um, surviving in this kind of situation, then we need a, a major rethink. Uh, and, and whether it's the trust fund, whether it's the UN corridor, whether mm -hmm. it's the um, humanitarian exchange facility that's just been announced, um, none of those, or even those together, are not going to solve the problem. David, uh, I know you touched on this a bit in your last answer, but um, I just want to dig in a little deeper on it. I mean, critics of the executive order say that it's convoluted and that this process is going to be potentially long and messy. First, I want to ask you, what do you think? Does this have the potential to be really messy? Second, I want to ask you, as far as President Biden's perspective, I mean, was this politically really the only sort of compromise he could make when it comes to these funds? Well, first, uh, there's a very high probability that it will become uh, even messier. Uh, as everything relating to Afghanistan uh, currently is, as uh, both Haroon and Pauline have pointed out. I think it's important to, f to also recognize what the two of them said. Uh, before the Taliban takeover, uh, Afghanistan was a poor country with a very marginalized economy, uh, with people suffering from starvation and lack of access to health care. All of those problems existed before uh, August. The kind of uh, Afghanistan has not been a normal country for decades and decades. And to make Afghanistan uh, or help Afghanistan to enable Afghanistan to become a normal country, uh, the rest of the world spent 20 years and 
uh, trillions of dollars or billions of dollars, hundreds of billions of dollars to try to do that over the last 20 years without very much success. Uh, the, in, that, in that context, I would say that the release or non-release of these funds is really irrelevant uh, to the larger picture, uh, to the larger question that Pauline has made. To. How do you uh, have a functioning economy in Afghanistan? How do you give the people of Afghanistan um, uh, hope that they can enjoy the same uh, economic and social benefits that uh, many of the people in the rest of the world do? Uh, that's a question that no one has an answer for, and releasing or not releasing these funds uh, is not going to make really any appreciable difference in that. One thing that's, I think, also important to recognize is the Taliban so far have shown no capacity to address the issues that Pauline has raised. The Taliban uh, fought in order to take over the country. They fought, they, they've taken over the country. They've reimposed the same government with the same people who governed from, say, 1996 to 2001 during which period of time uh, the humanitarian and health uh, issues, health problems uh, that um, uh, existed then, which were even more severe than, than now, mm -hmm. were addressed almost entirely by international organizations and, and um, uh, organizations such as the Norwegian Council. Uh, that was not a very satisfactory situation, but the Taliban seemed happy with it. And I think that's where we're headed, uh, sort of a return to what happened between 1996 and 2001, where Afghanistan was a poor country, where the humanitarian needs were addressed by those uh, humanitarian organizations uh, mm -hmm. that were willing to work in Afghanistan, but uh, no, really no hope of progress toward the normalcy that Pauline and Haroon would like to see. Haroon, um, Afghanistan's central bank also has about $2 billion scattered around in countries like Switzerland, the UAE, UK, Germany. Um, will this executive order from President Biden set any kind of a precedent with regard to the monies in those countries? Um, obviously, there is one major difference, that is the 9-11 survivals lawsuit, which does not exist in other countries. But the other aspect of it, um, it is likely to have an impact because it would be uh, the U.S. making determination as to how it would deal with the reserves of Afghanistan as long as Afghanistan is controlled by a U.S.-sanctioned entity. As you may, as you know, U.S. sanctions are in effect global, so it could be um, they're kind of giving guidelines to other countries as to how they could navigate uh, the assets of Afghanistan as a country now that it's the country is controlled by a U.S. sanctioned and U.N. sanctioned uh, uh, group. Um, although those countries often have signaled that they are willing to do more to help Afghanistan, some countries in Europe are much more concerned about the flow of immigration, uh, uh, refugees to those countries. So they've been maybe taking more proactive measures and really don't know um, whether they're going to follow suit or not. I would like to also uh, respond to what um, something that uh, uh, Mr. Sidney said. Um, th it is very true that really no one knows um, whether Afghanistan can have a functioning economy, what it takes for Afghanistan to have a functioning economy. And I absolutely agree that a lot of onus is on the Taliban as the party in charge of the country to figure that out, make the right choices, and all of that. But I would also like to point out that we really don't, we really know how to make sure Afghanistan won't have a functioning economy. And as many have said, I mean, uh, if you do, if these measures are implemented as they are laid out, it is going to ensure that there will be no chance of a uh, functioning economy returning in Afghanistan, returning to Afghanistan, even in medium term. I mean, no country can function without foreign reserve. No currency can be stabilized without foreign reserve. And in terms of the past 20 years, I mean, there were two major issues. One was war, and now it's over. In effect, there's been drop in violence, uh, violent events. Um, we don't have the perfect information, but it seems to be a major drop. And there's been no dividend uh, from peace because the economic system that emerged over the past 20 years was very much dependent on foreign money, and that money stopped, more or less. The other major issue that made Afghanistan a very poor country over the past 20 years mm -hmm. was the waste and corruption that was going on because of mostly the way the money was spent in the country. A lot of money was spent through unaccountable means, mm -hmm. uh, very gray areas. The same is continuing. The, as, a result, as a result of sanctions and other measures taken by the Taliban, and I'm not trying to put blame on anyone here, but as a result of those situations, mm -hmm. the UN is pretty much in charge of the whole country. And it is a continuation of what has happened in 20 years. So. We didn't see any dividend from peace because of the um, um, sanctions and uh, the way the U.S. the Taliban came to power mm -hmm. and all the economic consequences of that. And we are going to see the continuation of the way the country was run uh, because the U.N. is basically put in charge um, of the country 
basic services. David, uh, when it comes to the part of the executive order dealing with the 9-11 victims' families, um, there are many cases in the U.S., as I understand it, tied to 9-11, but not all 9-11 victims' families think that this executive order is a good idea. Is that correct? That's very true. A number of the 9-11 families, uh, represented by the 9-11 families, have spoken up and saying uh, they don't want to have this money uh, that could be used for humanitarian other activities in Afghanistan. Uh, others, unfortunately, others, in my view, unfortunately, have said they do want the money. Uh, the lawyers in these cases have been very aggressive. Um, I think that's one of the uh, weaknesses of the U.S. Uh, legal system, that this kind of thing can happen. Um, my, my own personal preference would have been to have all the money moved to the humanitarian fund. Uh, but under the U.S. legal system, uh, I don't think that was going to be feasible for uh, President Biden. Um, whether he had to keep as much money as he did uh, is an open question. And again, as, um, uh, as Professor Haroon Rahimi mentioned, um, there will be plenty of legal opportunities uh, for the Taliban if they wish to contest this uh, in court, even though they've already have a judgment against them. They can contest the use of these funds this way. Whether they um, have the capacity to contest that is another question, but they certainly have the, uh, that's certainly a possibility. Pauline, the uh, NRC has said that you all face lots of blockages in getting funds into Afghanistan and withdrawing money for use in humanitarian operations. Over the course of the past couple of months, has that improved in any way or is it still as difficult or even more difficult to withdraw money, to get money into the country? It's getting a little bit easier. Uh, in 2021, we had over a thousand um, challenges to bringing money into the country. Um, and so far this year, we've had two or three. We have managed to bring some money in, but it's not the amount that we would need to deliver the programs that we have. But if it's a problem for us, then it's an even bigger problem for national NGOs who cannot access any money from outside the country whatsoever. So that's a whole sphere of aid programs that are not able to be implemented um, because organizations can't get the funds that they need. And I, I was just thinking as my colleagues were talking, um, what does this mean for people on the ground? So when I go out and I visit communities and I, I meet people that NRC is trying to help, I, I meet people who are having to make really, really hard choices between selling their three month old son in order to pay for healthcare um, for, for the father of the family, um, whether they have to sell an organ in order to be able to feed their families, uh, whether they have to send children out onto the streets to work rather than being able to go to school. These are all daily choices. This is the impact on people's daily lives of what the economic um, strangulation is, is affecting um, and impacting on, on everyday people. And these are not an exception. These are hundreds and thousands of people who are having to make these choices on a daily basis. And Pauline, we just have about a minute left. If I could just ask you also, from your vantage point, what are some concrete steps that could be taken right now in order to get more aid into Afghanistan immediately? A freeing up of the access to financial services, um, the central bank, freeing up money from the World Bank to be able to um, pay healthcare workers and education workers, um, and, and getting that money to the national NGOs that have been starved um, of funding for the last few months, All the right. last year almost, to be honest. All right. Well, we have run out of time, so we're going to have to leave the conversation there. Thank you so much to all of our guests, David Sedney, Pauline Bolleman, and Haroon Rahimi. And thank you, too, for watching. You can see the program again anytime by visiting our website, aljazeera.com. And for further discussion, go to our Facebook page. That's facebook.com forward slash AJ Inside Story. You can also join the conversation on Twitter. Our handle is at AJ Inside Story. For me, Mohammed Jamjoum, and the whole team here, bye for now.